you. Thank you very much. Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome. <laughs> you did that very well. I did right. Next week you can have hello as well. Thank you. You're a very, very good person. <laughs> In our search now for the nation's choice as the world's greatest sporting legend. On each Sunday evening throughout June and July, we'll be examining a particular sport or combination of sports. An expert panel has made their pick of the legends in each category, and over the following week, you at home will have the final say, voting as to who goes through to our grand final on July 24th, or indeed telling our experts that they may have got it all terribly wrong. And here is our magnificent trophy, especially designed for us by the star jeweller, Theo Fennell. Now, our panel this week has picked ten football legends. We'll see them in action, we'll talk about their triumphs, and we'll definitely talk about the stars who didn't make it to the final ten. But in the end, it'll be up to you. And do get those votes in, because everyone who votes goes into the draw for a fabulous sporting holiday. Imagine your excitement building up as you watch them knocking up at Wimbledon, or warming up at Wembley, or tapping up at Chelsea. <laughs> We'll tell you all about it later in the programme. OK, let's introduce our panel for tonight. First, a man who very nearly won the World Cup for England back in 1990. He's managed top clubs and won many honours all over Europe, and in his time was no mean player, Sir Bobby Robson. <laughs> our next guest... Thank you. Our next guest won seven league championships with Liverpool, an FA Cup, two European Cups and two UEFA Cups. Oh, and 42 international caps as well. Phil Thompson. Our next panellist has been manager of England and Aston Villa, not to mention Watford. He's now a perceptive football broadcaster. He is, therefore, Graham Taylor. Bring a bit of objectivity to the proceedings, a football writer of the year, biographer of Giggs, Best and Sven Joran Eriksson, Joe Lovejoy of the Sunday Times. What a team. Now, if you don't agree with the panel's choice of football legends, or you have any other point you'd like to make, tell us all about it by texting, comment, followed by what you have to say to 81106 or email us at legend at sky1.co.uk. So, Bobby, just a quick word with you to start. How tough has it been finding the top ten sporting legends? It was extremely tough. Uh, the problem was not uh, choosing uh, who to go in, but who to leave out. Uh, because we have had to leave out some extraordinary players. And it's difficult picking players from different eras, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. And uh, sometimes the greatest player in your country isn't the greatest player in, in the world, and that's what we're talking about. The greatest legends we've ever seen, wherever you might come from. Thanks, Bob. Well, now, it's hardly a surprise that getting a consensus out of our guests was a bit of a mission, but let's see who has emerged as the first three choices as the all-time legends of football. We begin with Bobby Charlton, a Manchester United icon and England's all-time leading scorer. Right back, Tony Dunn finds Charlton. What a fantastic goal! The forward began his career at Old Trafford in the mid-50s and was fortunate to be a survivor of the Munich air crash. Nobody dares to call the new Manchester United a scratch team any longer. Bobby Charlton slams it home. On the pitch, his spectacular goals were nothing short of pure genius, making him a footballing god with the Old Trafford faithful. First of all, he started off as a winger, started off as a left winger, then he became a centre forward, then he became a midfield player, and he was the best around at all of those things. During his glittering international career, he scored a record 49 goals, including three defining strikes in the 66 World Cup finals. Bobby Charlton, another great goal! He had two bits of dynamite in his feet. He could run the ball. You know, 30, 40 yards without 
losing possession. He could take people on. He could go past people with the ball. He could win matches on his own. At club level, he enjoyed continuing success, powering his team to a prestigious European Cup win in 1968. Excellent professional, model professional, would be in anyone's list of uh, all-time greats. Next, it's Diego Maradona, Argentina's pocket genius with a golden touch. His dazzling skills were spotted when he was just 10 years old and won his first major medals with Boca Juniors. He exploded on the European stage when he joined Napoli in 1984. But it's his role in the 1986 World Cup finals that will never be forgotten. First, for this. And then... But he had that much confidence in his ability, and he's gone round, round, round with everybody, round on the, the, the keeper, and sh slotted it into the net. That was just genius, pure, pure genius. Off the pitch, constant drug allegations clouded the rest of his career. But on the pitch, his legacy remains. He had this wonderful brain, uh, what to do with the ball. And he, he hardly made a mistake. Very rarely did Maradona lose the ball, either on dribbles, on running the ball, or on passing the ball, or controlling the ball. Everything that you thought a player should do when you're watching a player, he did. Now Michel Platini, the French maestro and the most successful captain of their national team. The creative midfielder had huge success at the Italian giants Juventus in the 1980s and also set the world alight with France. I remember going to watch England play France in 1984 in Paris and Platini beat uh, uh, Peter Shilton with a free kick from the edge of the box. It was absolutely superb. He made France's number 10 shirt famous and was without doubt his country's greatest captain, appearing in three World Cup finals. He'd always influence the game by free kicks. Free kicks from any area just around the box, whether it's wide or whether it's, it's right there. He could bring upon that little bit of magic, that creation, and, and either create a goal or score a goal out of nothing. And that's what made him different from a lot of other players who played that number 10 role. Arguably his finest hour came in 1984 when he scored nine goals in five games as France won the European Championship. He was one of the world's greatest inside forwards and uh, I can understand why he's, uh, he's in this category. A special moment for us there, Charlton, Maradona and Platini, our panel's first three choices for football legends. But before we ask our panellists why those three, let's see what the stats have to say. And we've got Georgie Thompson every week as our statistician and here she is, Georgie. Thanks very much indeed, David. For each player, we'll show you identical facts and figures so you can compare their legendary status. Plus, we'll tell you some things you might not have realised. We'll start with Bobby Charlton. 106 caps and England's all-time leading scorer, but what did Charlton do for his beloved Manchester United? At the end of his career, he'd scored 245 goals in 751 games for the Reds and 294 goals overall. It is, though, perhaps surprising that if we turn that into a goals-per-game ratio, he only scored in one in three games he played in. What the stats don't show is that Charlton always scored goals when the pressure was on. Two goals to secure Manchester United's first ever European Cup in 68. And of course, his brace putting England into the World Cup final in 66 is one international honour. Next up, the one, the only, Diego Maradona with 91 caps. The troubled but brilliant Argentinian single-handedly led Argentina to the World Cup in 86, his one international trophy. He has, incidentally, over 21 years spent more time on the pitch during the World Cup 
than any other of our nominees. Just under 2,000 minutes in 21 matches. And at 5'5", five five, he's the shortest man on our list. On to Michel Platini, the mercurial Frenchman played 72 matches for his country. He remains France's all-time top scorer with 41 international goals. His one international honour came in 1984 when he scored nine goals to help France win the European Championship. He also scored the ultimate hat-trick against Yugoslavia. One goal with each foot and a header. David. Thank you very much indeed. And now let's uh, turn to the first question here, which uh, springs up, which obviously is that Bobby Charlton, rather appropriately, an, an Englishman for the first, first one up, and uh, yet he was not a striker, he was more in midfield than a striker, really, although he's got the greatest number of goals, 49. Um, that's a double achievement, really, isn't it, Graham? Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic achievement, as you quite rightly say, David, but the thing, all three players, and Bobby was one, they're in the heart of the action. Yep. When they come in, if you look at the selections, they're people that affect the game. And these end up being great players. They're where the action takes place, and if it's not, they go and make the action themselves. And that was Bobby Charlton. And why Platini, Phil? I just think, I was lucky enough to play against him or be on the same pitch as him, but he was absolutely fantastic. And you're looking at the three of them, but Platini more so. Just to change your pace from the three of them. And Platini could do that, he could go up to people very, very slow, and then go past people, he could create, and then he could score some of the best goals that you would ever witness, left foot, right foot. As we've seen in some of the clips before, he scored a lot of headers for not the biggest of uh, strikers or number tens playing just behind the, the front man. Joe, the others did, but you didn't vote for Maradona. Why was that? No, I didn't. Um, the reason being that... Uh, while he was clearly a fantastic footballer, I prefer my legends to be role models, and I think the way his uh, career disintegrated towards the end left quite a, a bit to be desired in that respect. He was kicked out of Italy where he was playing for, dr for drug abuse and then, and then kicked out of the 1994 World Cup for the same thing. And I, you know, that, that leaves me wondering how many of his performances were chemically enhanced. Uh, can I say that this is where Joe and I would disagree. If you start to involve people's private life, then I'll tell you what, there wouldn't be any legends in any, any sport. There'd be no <laughs> politicians. There'd be nothing. So I made, in my view, I made a definite separation between private lives and what they actually did on the field. So that's a, a slight disagreement that Joe would ha and I would have. Not for the first time, of course. <laughs> Do you have that? Uh, well, I, I appreciate George's remarks, and he's quite right, of course, but uh, I also, you know, recommend what Graham has said. I chose Maradona because of what he did on a 90-yard a by 70-yard football pitch. He was wonderful on grass. Not the one he smoked, but the one he played. <laughs> Bobby. Bobby, let me ask you one, one question about possible legends. We know he's not in the top ten. Young Wayne Rooney, how far away is he from legendary status at his young age? Well, uh, he's almost there. I just think in, in this country we have an artist, we have a genius on our hand. We have to look after him, make sure he stays on the straight and narrow. But if we do that, we have produced in this country the most wonderful futuristic player we've been looking enough to, uh, to, to inherit for, for years. But, it, but the same thing applies, really. What Joe was saying is beware the lifestyle, won't you, Joe? Yes, I don't think there's any suggestion that Wayne Rooney is, is yet into what uh, Maradona was into, and I hope he won't get into that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Rooney has, I would argue, still has quite a lot to prove. I mean, I... I very reluctant to describe contemporary players as legends. Thank you, Joe. So three nominations there, another seven to come, but the choice that matters in the long, long run will be yours. We'll be giving you the full details later in the programme, and we'll be revealing the panel's other seven choices. So stay with us in our search for the world's greatest sporting legend. Uh, well, I would say Pele, without question. He's been the... Pele is soccer. Sporting legend of all time has to be probably Diego Maradona because even though he cheated against England, uh, football is the greatest sport of all time and I think he's probably the best person to ever play it. Thank you. Welcome back to our quest to find the world's greatest sporting legend. Before the break, our panel nominated Bobby Charlton, Diego Maradona, 
and Michel Platini as their first three legends. Joe Lovejoy, did you think of including managers or did you confine it to players? I thought of managers. The original brief I was given was non-specific. It just said <laughs> ten football legends and I didn't see why managers shouldn't be included that, especially the two that I mentioned on my original list. One of those was um, Bill Shankly, who I can't think of anyone of more legendary status than that. Every time I walked through the Shankly gates at Anfield, I think of him. Um, he turned Liverpool from a fairly modest second division club they were then, we, we call it the championship now, he turned them from a, a second division club striving for promotion but never quite getting there. He took them up and turned them into the best team in the country. Obviously it was Bob Paisley who went on and made them the best team in Europe. The other manager I, I thought I couldn't omit if I was using my own criteria was, uh, was Brian Clough who did something that will never ever be done again, took two fairly modest um, teams from, again, from the old second division. To the uh, championship. Provincial teams to the championship. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was two managers there by Joe. And indeed, one of our panellists on the racing show, horse racing show, nominated the Queen Mother, in fact, at one point. So uh, <laughs> we've had a wide range of nominations. Time to move on now to our panel's next four nominees. And by the way, there's some flash photography in this. First up, Johan Cruyff, a Dutch master who was one of the most lethal finishers in the game. He began his career as a 17-year-old at Ajax, terrorising defenders. A clearance is fumbled and Cruyff scores for Ajax. In the 1970s, he was the architect behind the club's three successive European Cups. His skill, vision and goals saw him voted European Player of the Year three times. He was part and parcel of what became known as total football in the Dutch side and he led it. He was very self-opinionated, but actually he delivered the goods so you couldn't really argue with him. But he had great vision. Cruyff's impact on the international scene was just as deadly. Although he never won the World Cup, his sublime touches will never be forgotten. He gave to us one particular um, trick, and that was the Cruyff turn. And kids for years and years were practicing this, this turn. Retiring in 1984, he continued as a coach, most notably for Barcelona, winning 11 Spanish trophies, including four successive titles and a European Cup. Now 60s star John Charles, a versatile Welshman dubbed the UK's greatest all-round footballer. He first played for Leeds United in 1949 as a strapping six-foot-two teenager, regularly playing either as a centre-half or a free-scoring striker. This fella, not only was he head and shoulders physically above any other player on the pitch, he was head and shoulders above them talent-wise. As a forward, he still holds the Leeds record of 42 goals in one season. He hardly ever got a yellow card or got booked. He hardly ever gave away a foul. He was as clean a player as I've ever, ever seen. John Charles also spent five glorious years at Juventus. He continued scoring goals at an unheard of rate in the Serie A and at the training ground above the bar where they get served their coffee etc is a huge picture of which player John Charles that, that says it all when you think of all the fantastic players that have played for Juventus that John Charles is still revered there that says it all he was also an inspiration for Wales and guided them to their only ever appearance in World Cup finals back in 1958 read everything about him and you'll suddenly say hey hold on a minute this is a legend There has to be a place for England's only World Cup winning captain, Bobby Moore. He's arguably England's greatest defender. During the early 60s, his club West Ham decided to build the entire team around him. He could actually bring the ball out and pass the ball out. In those days, particularly, you got rid of the ball. He wasn't particularly quick, but his ability to read the play ahead of other players was absolutely superb. His huge influence saw him become England's youngest ever captain at just 22. Moore takes the kick, and Jeff has put England level. 
Moore's leadership and battling pride established his place in history in 1966. He put in some of the best tackles that I've ever seen. Not one, not a sliding tackle or doing everything, but it was the timing of it, because you know sometimes it's one on one. And he would wait and wait and wait and jockey somebody into the right position, and then he would commit himself. Perhaps the highest compliment paid in his career came in 1970 after his heroic and brave display against Pele's Brazil in that World Cup. Brazil had beaten us, and there's him and Pele swapping shirts after the game. And I think that basically represents the thoughts that Pele had for him, and obviously what Bobby Moore had for Pele. Finally, Bobby Moore's greatest rival, Germany's accomplished captain, Franz Beckenbauer. The defender's career began with Bayern Munich, and over the next 25 years, he won almost every honour in the game. With a terrific shot, Beckenbauer scored. Looked beautiful on the ball. Had this air of superiority and composure and vision. And, you know, he could, he could be looking at the play, and, but he always knew where the ball was. He was a formidable captain who led a strong West Germany side to victory in the 1972 European Championships. He knew at the right times when to attack and when to, when to move out from defence and score vital goals in a game. And that's, that's what I think makes somebody a legend. His crowning glory was in 1974 when, having already sewn up the league title and the European Cup with Bayern, he then added a World Cup winner's medal on top. Not only captained them to a World Cup victory, but managed Germany to a World Cup victory. I'll tell you what, you're definitely a legend in Germany. <laughs> You've got to be a legend worldwide to do that. Well, there they are, John Charles, Bobby Moore, Franz Beckenbauer, and Johann Cruyff, who was described once as Pythagoras in boots. Great names, all of them, bringing back great memories. But what do the stats have to say about them? Georgie? Thank you, David. We start with Johann Cruyff, inventor of the Cruyff turn and the brains behind Holland's total football revolution. The Fiery Dutchman scored 425 goals in a career spanning 752 professional games. He scored three World Cup goals in 74, helping Holland to the final. And what's more, all 15 of Holland's goals in West Germany either started or finished with Cruyff. He's one of only two men we'll feature tonight, never to have lifted a trophy with his country. But his club honours eclipse everybody else's 22 medals to his name, including an incredible seven Dutch championships and three European Cups. Now to John Charles with a total of 286 career goals and legendary at Leeds United for his record of 42 goals in a single season. But was he as impressive elsewhere? The answer, yes, Charles was a class act. He has four club honours and at Juventus he hit home 93 goals in 155 games against the world's best defenders. No easy task. Now to Bobby Moore. Of all our nominees, Moore won the most international caps, 108 in total, including a record 90 as England captain. Perhaps Pelé summed Moore up best when he described him as the greatest defender he had ever played against. On to Franz Beckenbauer, who had the longest playing career of our lineup tonight, 25 years. He also managed 64 career goals, five in the World Cup, giving a pretty good idea of why he terrified the opposition. And if we look at his scoring tally next to our other defender, Bobby Moore, well, Beckenbauer, more like a midfielder. He scored twice as many goals. Desmond. Thank you. Bobby, you would have had to play against Bobby Moore from time to time with your Ipswich teams. How did you cope with him? With difficulty. <laughs> he was the golden boy of soccer, uh, Bobby. He looked golden. He was golden. And he played golden football. I think Phil said uh, his reading of the game was astute. That means to say he knew the development of the game before it actually happened. Mm -hmm. 
Bobby had this yeah. wonderful... He never got dirty, did he, Bob? No. He never got dirty. He never seen him with dirty shorts. <laughs> I think he was a defender. But he was absolutely that's, superb. That's a fascinating yeah. detail. Yeah. The story yeah. thing, Graham... <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not that fascinating. <laughs> Quite fascinating. <laughs> it's reasonably fascinating. <laughs> Graham, I think you mentioned that, I mean, he, he, they used to say about him that he didn't head the ball very well. Um, uh, Phil said he tackled a lot, but he, he didn't have biting tackles. He had time tackles. He had, he had no pace, they say, and yet he was a genius. How, how does that work out? Simply on the timing and being able to get your positioning early. The, 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 I mean, Phil will say this, the art of real defending is to be in the right position early. You read it, you nick it, and what good defenders do is they never go to ground unless they win the ball. Mm -hmm. That's the art of good defending. Right. Moving on to some of the others as well. Joe, you were passionate there about John Charles, and of course he was the first Brit to really succeed in Italy, wasn't it? And uh, according to the paper today, when his manager said, Juventus wants you, he said, what's Juventus? In those days, there was not that sort of coverage of European football. What was his genius? Well, I don't know, Everything. Of, any, don't know of any other player who could play in two positions as well as he did. Uh, I can remember Billy Wright saying he was the best striker he played against, and Don Revy said he was the best centre-half he'd seen. Now, that, that, a credible recommendation that is. He could play those two positions equally as well and he scored a fantastic number of goals in Italy having done so in England as well and he, could, he played, in the, played for Wales frequently at centre-half and distinguished himself at centre-half for Wales. And did you, did you ever see John Charles in the flesh because you're so young? No, well that's, that's it. I, the criteria what I had for, for most of my players was I had to see them play and you know, if there's other players coming up, I never seen John Charles play. And yes, I've heard the legend that is John Charles, and he played at the back and he played up front. But I thought, how can I judge somebody that I've not even seen play? Obviously, he didn't have Sky Television then, and, and everything Sky Sports News or whatever. But it's it's just I couldn't put that down and honestly say that this guy's a legend. I don't know whether Joe's seen him play. Yes. He don't look old enough. So Bobby back. wants they to get him. They, they, they would uh, pick him at centre forward. He scored three goals, and then to make sure they won, they played him at centre half to make sure nobody scored. And that, that, that was a terrific player. He could, he could um, play equally well in both positions. It was difficult to know which was his best position. He was an absolutely superb and, player. And as between Beckenbauer and Cruyff, uh, what's your comparison there, Graham? Well, very interesting. I mean, Beckenbauer, after the World Cup, he'd been using 66 to apparently mark Bobby Charlton in midfield. Germany learnt, learnt a great from that. He went back as a sweeper. But actually, he didn't just stay behind the defence. He would come through and use those midfield skills to create and even score goals. So he, he created, started there. He created a new yeah. position, which he they did. called libero. He wasn't a sweeper, he was the libero, which is the defender who can bring the ball out and start the play in the midfield. Do you remember? Libero. Six. Thanks. We've just got to move on now, chaps. Those are the Sorry. selections so far. Soon it'll Sorry. be down to you to choose. You have to vote to pick which footballing legend goes through to the grand final on July 24th. But hold off. For just a little while longer, we've only had seven so far of our panel's ten choices. Three more still to come. By the way, when you do vote, your name goes into that draw for a sporting holiday. Georgie will tell you what you can win. Up for grabs are two tickets to one of the world's great sporting events. Should you win, you could be watching the inaugural FA Cup final at the new Wembley Stadium. Jetting to Ireland to enjoy some Ryder Cup golf. Relaxing in the summer sun for an England test match. Flying to New York to catch the US Open men's tennis final. Or even see Rugby World Champions England take on the Aussies at Twickenham. Vote for your legend and one of these fantastic trips could be yours. What a glorious prospect. And remember, you've got all the week till next week's show to vote. After the break, our panel's last three contenders for the world's greatest footballing legend. We've not had Pelé yet, nor Pushkas, nor not even David Beckham. Now, surely they can't leave him out. We'll find out. The greatest football legend for me is Pelé. Uh, I remember the World Cup final 1958 in Stockholm in Sweden. He was only 17. He scored goals. Brazil won the World Cup and uh, he became the king over a night and he was the king for 10-15 years after that. He, uh, he was the biggest, I think. Well, I'm going to choose 
person whose picture adorned my bedroom walls uh, from the ages of about nine to 16, um, when I discovered Olivia and John, um, which is George Best. But I guess a lot of people call me George Best, but I have to be one of the crowd. Uh, he just kind of did things with the football that I've never seen done before or since. Well, is Angus Staten going to be disappointed? Wouldn't be a first. Hello again. So far, our expert panel have selected seven of football's top ten legends, just three left to nominate. And then it's all over to you. Satellite viewers can vote through the red button, log on to skyone.co.uk, or text the word legend to 81106. And you can just win that prize of a fabulous VIP sporting trip of your choice. Bob, Bobby, we're getting a lot of texts about Gascoigne, about Gazza, that he should be one of the legends. I mean, what's your feeling about that? Nobody knows Gascoigne better than you. Well, he should be. He should be. He's everything, isn't he? But uh, uh, wonderful kid. Uh, daft as a brush. Um, I termed him that. You did. Uh, uh, one day in the World Cup in 1990, 15 years ago, when he's 22 years of age, we're playing Cameroon to get into the last four of the World Cup. We've trained the morning, it's the day before the semi-final, it's 90 degrees, players have to rest. We went for a team meeting, he's missing. I said to the players, where's Gas going? Chrissy Wall went like that. I said, what, what do you mean, Chrissy? what's that? He, he meant, well, look behind. There was just some tennis courts behind the, the swimming pool. Went to the top of the fence, looked below, Gas going is playing tennis. He's playing a five-set tennis game with an American guy who he's never met in his life. <laughs> And I shouted, Gaza, what are you doing? <laughs> it went like this. Yeah. And risking injury, and we trained that morning, like I'm saying, the, the object was to rest, stay out of trouble, you know, keep low, keep your head below the parapet, don't let anything happen. And he's risking life and limb playing Bob a game of tennis. Bobby was most upset because he was winning the match. <laughs> <laughs> but what a player. Yeah, absolutely, OK. Right, let's find out who the final three nominations are for football's greatest legend. We begin with the world's most expensive footballer, French playmaker Zinedine Zidane. He began his playing career in 1989, but it wasn't until he signed for Juventus in 1996 that he grabbed all the headlines. He glides across the pitch, and he's not a sort of a thin man. He's big, he's bulky, huge thighs, but he's got some fantastic skill. And he does it as, at the most ridiculous moments in time. There can be two or three players around him, and he'll drag the ball back through his legs, through somebody else's legs, and have it all in the one movement, and then move away and create space for himself. In 1998, he powered France to victory over Brazil with two bullet headers to claim the World Cup. If you watch a game of football, and he'll stand out like a lighthouse. Squeeze passes into, into the play that you thought he can't get that ball through there. Two years later, he was at it again, this time in the European Championship, as France became the kings of Europe. In 2001, he became the world's most expensive footballer, signing for Real Madrid for a whopping £46 million. Pounds. He's a superb player with a great temperament. And I just think we will look back at him in 10 years' time and we'll say he was a true legend. Beautiful skill! Oh, I say, what a goal that is! Next, there's the great Hungarian, Ferenc Puskas, a phenomenal goal scorer for both club and country. He began his career in Budapest at the end of the war and hit the headlines in Britain when he helped Hungary crush England 6-3 at Wembley in 1953. Just watch the smart footwork by Puskas. Fantastic play. If you're talking about passing the ball and you're talking about tricks, there's nobody better than Franz Puskas, the galloping major. He was a World Cup runner-up in 1954 and had an astonishing international striking rate, 83 goals in 84 appearances. Put Ferenc Puskas in with the ball, 30 yards from goal, and there was a great chance it would finish in the back of the net. He joined Real Madrid, 
where he became a cult hero. The highlight was the 1960 European Cup final where he bagged four goals in a historic 7-3 win. We should never forget people like this. It's all right, you know, yes, he is one of the older school. Boy, he could play. Last, but certainly not least, Pelé. The three times World Cup winner began his career at South American side Santos, making his debut when he was just 16. The talk about players now being tired after 38 Premiership games and European games. If you look what Pelé played, and they were abroad, they went all over. They were going into... Pelé was playing something like about 80, 90 games a season. Less than a year later, he stunned the world, scoring six goals to secure Brazil the 1958 World Cup. I, I saw him score in the semi-final and in the final there, and he was 17 going on 18, and he, he was just a fantastic player even at that age. He was back on the goal trail in 62, when once again Pelé found the net, and once again Brazil won the World Cup. He's an ambassador for football now, but he was an ambassador for how football should have been played then. Never got involved. Still had this great steely determination to win and succeed and, uh, and win the ball in the air, win the ball on the ground. He was the ultimate team player. In 1970, after conquering England, despite that save from Gordon Banks, Pelé went on to lift the trophy for the third time, scoring Brazil's 100th World Cup goal. The memory and the recollection of how he played football and what he achieved and the things that he tried. He was never frightened of trying anything, however outrageous it was, just puts a smile on your face. Well, we'll, uh, we'll hear what the panel says in a moment, but first here's Georgie with a few facts and figures, our facts, her figure. <laughs> David, thank you. Zinedine Zidane, our only nominee still playing at Real Madrid. He retired from the French team with 93 caps, having achieved, well, everything, including World and European Cup medals. He even managed a couple of goals in the World Cup final. He is the most expensive footballer ever, but is he worth it? Well, Real Madrid bought him for 46 million, which means the Spanish Giants have so far splashed out over a quarter of a million pounds per match, or let's break that down even further, over one and a half million pounds per goal for his services. Bargain, some might say. Frank Pushkas, 407 goals in total, but his scoring rate for Hungary defies belief. He notched up 83 goals in just 84 matches and he also picked up four caps for Spain whilst in exile, which explains his total of 88 international caps. That leaves just Pele. Over 1,200 goals, eclipsing the scoring tally of any of our other nominees. He also played a record-breaking 1,363 games over 21 years. Of those goals, 77 were for Brazil in 92 matches, which, if we make a straight comparison with our previous nominee, Pushkas, leaves Pele trailing with an 83.7% scoring ratio, well short of the Hungarian's total of 98.8%. Well, it makes you wonder just what the world would have made of Pushkas if it had more chances to go head-to-head -head with Pele during the advent of colour television. Just a thought. That's all the facts and figures. Maybe, just maybe, you've changed your mind on who statistically is the greatest footballing legend. David. Well, thank you very much indeed. And some of you may have read that uh, in one or two of the papers that it leaked the fact that uh, George Best had not been selected as one of the ten. And, uh, Graham, why was that? Well, I have to say this. If we look, all of the legends, they're 18 years to 25 years. George, 10 years. I think that's what his, his, his career was. Not his fault that playing for Northern Ireland didn't put him on the world stage and we're looking for world legends. And he, I'm saying that, and he's, he, he is the best British player that I've seen play live, but on a world legend stage, I couldn't put him in the top ten on those two facts. Bobby, sorry, David, did Bobby, did his life off the pitch affect your decision to leave him out? Um, George Best? Yeah. I never picked George Best. That's what I say. Did you, did you leave him out because of his life off the pitch? Uh, no, I, I left him out because at 27, can you imagine that? 27, he actually finished with professional football in this country. And I find that very sad. Because in actual fact, 27, 28, 29, 30, I think we will all agree, Phil, they are your best years. George Best played without his best years. 
So that was how such a phenomenal player he was. To, to and most and Phil, you were, you were half and half. You didn't put him in your top ten, but you put him as first reserve. Yeah, because he was, he was a fantastic player. We all remember, we all love seeing the people with great ability, great dribbling ability. People love that. I was a defender, but not too many defenders are in there. George was blessed with some great skills. Well, I agree with the chaps. Is that greatness, and that was one of my criteria, was you had to be playing beyond 30. And I think you had to do it over that long period of time, and George didn't. Joe, so Joe, durability is, is part yes. of it. Joe, you, you did vote for George Brown. Yes, he'd have been my top three. I think it's, uh, well, almost outrageous that he's not in there. I mean, this is the guy who, playing for a Manchester United team that included Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law, was leading scorer four times, playing on the wing. He had a fantastic career, although it was over t only over 10 years, only over 10 years. The things he achieved in those 10 years. When, uh, the 50 winners of the Football of the Year award were polled on who they thought the best player was of the last 50 years. George Best won by landslide. But Joe, you said you wanted your footballers to be role models. Yeah, George, to my... To my uh, <laughs> yes. Fair <laughs> point. <laughs> <laughs> To my, to, my, to my knowledge, he's, George has never been done for drugs. He's been done for drinking, but I think a few of us would be kicked off the panel if that was the, going to be the grass. <laughs> Shall we ask what, the audience? What? Yes. Let's, Let's ask turn the audience. to you, the audience. Do you think George should have been in the top ten? Yes. Who, say, who says yes? Show of hands, yes. Show of hands, no. Oh, well, that's very interesting. You've come, come down on the side of the three members of the panel. There's a majority of almost two to one against George Best being in the top ten. And very briefly, Phil, no goalkeepers in the ten. No, he isn't in the ten that they give, but I did put uh, Gordon Banks in mind. Oh, I, thought, I thought he deserved to. I thought he was a wonderful keeper, good temperament. Yes, everything about him. There we are. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, our panellists have had their say about their choices and even their controversial omissions, but now it really is up to you. Just one of the ten nominees will be going through to the grand final on July 24th, where they will compete against legends from other sports to decide who is the world's greatest sporting legend chosen by Sky viewers. So, get choosing. You can vote in three ways. Digital satellite viewers can vote interactively via the red button. David? Or you can vote on the internet by going to skyone.co UK, Des. Or you can text the word legend to 81106 and you'll receive a text back with voting instructions, apparently. It's easy. Whichever way you choose, just get voting. Just to jog your memory, here are the ten footballing legends that you can choose from. United and England hero, Charlton. Pocket genius, Maradona. French maestro, Platini. Dutch master, Cruyff. Welsh wonder, Charles. World Cup winner, Moore. Germany's artist, Beckenbauer. French playmaker, Zidane. Hungarian hotshot, Pushkas. Brazil's best ever, Pelé. Quite a choice, isn't it? And remember, just by voting, you go into that draw to win the choice of five sensational sporting trips. From the new Wembley's first FA Cup final to the men's final at the US Open. Plus, each week we're giving away two tickets to the world's greatest sporting legend, Grand Final. That's on July the 24th. Well, next week we look for the greatest boxing legend of all time. That should be very interesting. And, of course, we'll be able to tell you which of our ten footballers has won your vote. So, don't miss it. But for now, it's first of all, many thanks to that magnificent panel that we've got there. And thanks to all of you as well. See you next week. Bye-bye for now from me and from Deb.
Now, last week's programme was all about finding that football legend you've been voting all week, and this is how it turned out. In third place, with just over 9% of the vote, was the winning England World Cup captain, Bobby Moore. Incidentally, John Charles was very close behind him. In second place, with just over 10% of the vote, was that fraud genius from Argentina, Diego Maradona. But the clear winner with a massive 57% was the superstar from Brazil, Pelé.